So, breaking out of Satan's compromise. You get a little feeling uh, the lesson today. Throughout Scripture, we see God continually calling his people unto himself. God wants a relationship with us. We talk about that often. He is rightly jealous of that relationship. God's holy, pure, and loving jealousy is such an integral characteristic of God that he makes it unquestionably clear in the second commandment. You're familiar with the Ten Commandments? And the second one says there on your worksheet, Exodus 20, verse 5, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. So it's not a negative thing to call Lord God jealous. He tells us he's jealous, and rightfully so, as we'll uh, see even more and more this morning. In our text passage for today's study, God calls the children of Israel out of Egypt and to be with him. God is calling us out as well to walk with him, to talk with him, and to acknowledge his presence in every area of our lives. But as surely as God called the children of Israel out of Egypt, as sure, and as surely as God is calling us unto him, Satan is working to pull us away from God. They're in the tug of war, if you will. The devil, through Pharaoh, constantly challenged Moses and the children of Israel to compromise. He tried to keep them, at least partly, in Egypt. Similarly, in our lives, the devil is still trying to cut little deals with us to keep us out of church, out of the Bible, and away from the fully surrendering to God. He's after every little part of trying to keep us away from God. Paul spoke of this struggle in Galatians 5.17. It's there on your worksheet. Galatians 5.17. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things ye would. You know, and we, he talks elsewhere about his struggle, not being able to do what he knows and wants, and, you know, doing the other thing. And, you know, do you ever wonder why you just don't do what you know you should do? Yeah. I do. You know, why, or why did I do that? But also, why didn't I do that? You know, and it's that, you just have that constant struggle. Well, the Spirit, through the Word of God, leads us and teaches us to follow God's path. But the devil, through the world and the flesh, attempts us to draw us off God's path and away from the walk with God. You know, it's like just picture a, a, a rock in there, puts in our path to stumble over and maybe even fall into the ditch, you know. And so thankful God, I've been in that ditch. Thankfully, God has a loving reach to pull us back out. But that's a whole previous lesson. Throughout the book of Exodus, God calls his people away from Egypt. He wants his people absolutely out of and free from the land of Egypt. Egypt was a place of lust and consumption, where the Israelites thought only of themselves. We see that there on the worksheet, Exodus 16, verse 3. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full. For ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Not that always bothered me reading it, probably you too. Why are these ungr ungrateful people? <laughs> you know, what are they thinking? They were slaves and working hard and making, having to make, get their own straw for their birth. How soon we forget. How soon they forgot. And, uh, you know, to, to just wish they were back where it was more comfortable. But more on that later too. Because Egypt was also a place of idolatry. Worship to the devil and bondage. See that there in Deuteronomy 29, 16, and 17. For ye know how we have dwelt in the land of Egypt, and how we came through the nations which ye passed by. And ye have seen their abominations and their idols, wood and stone, silver and gold, which were among them. So they had seen all that and, and were aware of it. Egypt is a picture of what Satan wants to do with every Christian. A good example, and often used as an example, of, of the people of, of the world. 
He wants to pull us into a place of bondage, idolatry, and as far away from God as he can get us. We are confronted with a constant pull away from fellowship with the Lord. We experience this pull um, at every turn in the world. We are pulled by the media, people at work, Satan's demonic power, and by a million other devices of Satan. He's got no end to the things he tries to lure us away or drag us away, lead us away, however you want anything to get us away from the path of God. See, Egypt is a picture of the pull of the world on Christians. In today's study, we'll look at four temptations that Pharaoh offered Moses and see the correlation with the devil's temptation to us today. The number one is the temptation to conform. To conform. This is a strong one in our uh, world today. God had already brought the first four plagues upon the land of Egypt. You all know the pie, there was ten plagues. The first four, he had turned the Nile and all fresh water to blood. Then he had sent frogs that completely covered the land. I can't remember who it was. We were just talking to somebody that they had so many frogs one day, they, went, they couldn't mow the lawn. Literally, they, the lawn was completely covered with frogs. And uh, anyway, you know, no way to even scoop them. Anyway, that, it was just like, wow, what a picture of, you know, what that was just to think. Charlie and Mary, is that your story? That was a good story. Thanks for that. <laughs> And he had, third, he had made the dust of the land of Egypt to become lice. Thanks. You know what? Lice get into everything and on, in everybody's hair. And, and then number four, he had sent a grievous swarm of flies throughout all the land. And again, we've had to deal a little bit with black flies, you know, if you have, you're around a farm, a little barnyard. Or, and boy, they're biting. They're just miserable and can't get, you know, they're not big enough to swat. Anyway. You can just imagine all these things throughout the whole country. Egypt wasn't a small place, and they're covering the ground. But Pharaoh promised to let the people go during the plague of frogs. But when God removed the frogs, Pharaoh's heart hardened, and he changed his mind. Go figure. Now, in the plague of flies, Pharaoh offers Moses a deal. Notice the last three words of this offer. From Exodus 8.25 of our text, it says, And Pharaoh called for Moses and for Aaron and said, Go ye, sacrifice to your God in the land. He had the little end, not just go, but in the land. Pharaoh said the Israelites could sacrifice, but they must do it in the land of Egypt. In other words, you, you can go do it, but you're not leaving. You're not going three days into the wilderness. You're doing it, you know, go out to the field, basically. So, uh, first off, letter A, it was a conforming invitation. It was an invitation, but it asked them to conform. Pharaoh's invitation to Moses stated that they could go and sacrifice as long as they didn't actually leave the land of Egypt. It said, in effect, just stay here among our idols. Just join right in with everything else we're doing with our idols. This invitation confronts us boldly today. It presents itself to us at work at school, at social events, and it looks like this. Quote, you can have your kind of Christianity, but don't get carried away with it. Just stay here and hang out and do what you've always done. You know how? You know, just, yeah, just do it. Just go along to get along. You know, you can do that. Do your thing, but, you know, stay involved with us in what, how we do stuff. It was kind of a peer pressure. There was an interview with a man who had lived to be 100 years old. The reporter asked him, what do you think is the best thing about being your age? He, he said, that's easy. No peer pressure. <laughs> I like that. Too many people there say, you know. Yeah. And I kind of thought of that. You know, all the, you know, Laura and, and uh, Ella and some of these ladies that have hit 95 or even 90. They're some of the happiest people you know. They've got nobody else telling them how they should behave. I, I think I haven't never thought of that before, but it's probably true. Peer pressure affects everybody, and it comes to us in different forms. You might hear it like this. Don't expect a raise if you don't hang out with your peers after work. You can still be a Christian and go to church and be religious, but just do what we do anyway. 
And just go ahead and laugh at dirty jokes. You can still be religious, but just don't go all the way out for God. You know, there's so many different ways to phrase any of those, and I'm sure we've all been subject to something like that. Each of these statements is an invitation to stay in the land. Just stay right here with us a little bit. Yeah, do your thing, but stay here. The Bible plainly teaches how we should respond to that invitation. It's there on the worksheet, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. While this verse referred specifically to the pagan idols worship in the first century, it can refer to other idols today. It refers to overt idols of alcoholism and pornography. It refers to things we allow to become idols, such as riches or sports. God says, I want you to come out from that, and I want you to come all the way unto me. Come out and be separate. Don't stay in Egypt, is what he's telling us today, even today. <clears throat> oh, that, you know, and, and we, we run into this and have been there myself, but, oh, Lord, I'm comfortable. You know, even, even in my sad and kind of miserable state, at least I'm familiar with it. And, you know, don't ask me to, to leave my comfort zone. You know, it's a natural tendency for us to do. And, uh, you know, don't, just don't ask me to leave, Lord. I'm, I'm comfortable. We got to guard against that. And Moses gave a courageous response. Courageous. <clears throat> Moses' answer was obviously not what Pharaoh wanted to hear. You know, Pharaoh thought he made a pretty good deal. Yeah, go do it. You know, I'm giving, you give. Moses, however, Exodus 26, 28, 26, and 7 told us, and Moses said, it is not meat so to do. For we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. Lo, we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes. And will they not stone us? We will go three days' journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he shall command us. So he stood up to him. And, you know, it kind of made sense. The, the Egyptian people, remember, were polytheistic. They had many gods, meaning that how they worship many gods and many kinds of gods. The animals the Jews were going to sacrifice to God, the lambs and the rams, were some of the gods that Egypt worshipped. And uh, this would have been an abomination to the Egyptians. And I thought about that. What if some religious group came up and said, hey, can I use your field to uh, sacrifice your cats and dogs? You know, a lot of people have trouble even with the rams and the sheep, but, you know, but if they, if they wanted to come kind of and kill our, you know, people would be upset. I'd probably be one of the first ones in, in the flesh who'd want to pick up a stone. You know, get off my property. You're, you're doing that. You know, I love my little kitty cat and my dog, you know. And so it, it's just, you can picture that. That's how Moses is saying the Egyptians would react. They're not going to be happy with us, uh, you know, cutting up and, and uh, sacrificing their, their gods, you know, and... Not to say that we make gods out of our animals, but if the shoe fits, I guess we wear that. <clears throat> Moses told Pharaoh that if the Israelites stayed there in Egypt and offered sacrifices, they would be killing the very things that the Egyptians worshipped. If we kill these animals, Moses said, the Egyptians will stone us because we'd be violating their law right in front of them. Despite Pharaoh's firm invitation to worship in the land, Moses chose to obey God. This is our opportunity as well today. When we are tempted to compromise our faith or our obedience to God, we should courageously choose to obey God. That's worthy of repeating. When we are tempted to compromise our faith or our obedience to God, we should courageously choose to obey God. When given a choice, obey God. Then number two, we have the temptation to compromise. The temptation to compromise. When Pharaoh told Moses not to go very far away, he was offering a compromise. But Moses couldn't do it. Compromise is keeping oneself close enough to the world to still be influenced by it and kept in bondage to it. 
That also bears repeating. Christian compromise is keeping oneself close enough to the world to still be influenced by it and kept in bondage to it. Uh, there on your worksheet, Exodus 8, 28 through 32 says this. And Pharaoh said, I will let you go that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness. Only, here comes the second offer, ye shall not go very far away. Entreat for me or pray for me. And Moses said, Behold, I go out from thee, and I will entreat the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people tomorrow. But let not Pharaoh deal deceitfully any more in not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. And Moses went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses, and he removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people. There remained not one. And Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also, neither would he let his people go. Wow. Finally struck a deal, and what? He reneges on it right away. Just boom. Well, that was too easy. I'm not going to do that. He hardened his heart. So Pharaoh offered a compromising proposal. Another one, a compromising proposal. Well, you can go worship God, Pharaoh was saying. Just don't get carried away with it. Sound familiar? Some friend or relative says to you, I get it that you go to church on Sunday morning, but what's with Wednesday nights? You don't need to go to the Wednesday night thing. Discipleship? Well, that's just way overboard. Hey, you can go along with this Christianity thing, but just don't become a fanatic. Well, I've been there, people. I don't, you know, it's just, you know, your friends just don't want you to, to be fanatical about it, for goodness sakes. You know, why are you trying to talk to me about this, you goofball? <laughs> you know? Too many churches, however, now are willing to compromise, and thus too many people as well. They've adopted an accommodating theology where they try to blend the world's belief with the church's philosophy. People want less preaching, so the church gives less preaching. Praise God we don't say that about our church. <laughs> it's a compliment, Pastor. That's right. People want more entertainment, so the church provides entertainment. And we're all very familiar with the big churches nowadays that do just that, you know. Ten minutes of preaching and two hours of entertainment, really. The purpose of church, however, is to worship the living God. Amen. The compromising proposal, proposals of the world should not be the voice to which the church listens. It's not just the church who listens to the proposal of compromise, however. It's the girl who wants to dress modestly but is afraid she'll seem weird. It's the teenage boy who wants to glorify God, but knows he will seem out of place if he doesn't cuss and hang out with those that do. It's all of us who know what we should do and how we should stand up for Christ, but we struggle with standing for Christ in the moment. Uh, the Bible exposition commentary has a quote there on your worksheet. Don't go too far away, the enemy whispers. Don't go too far away. Or people will call you a fanatic, but demolish that proposal, is the quote. We should just not even consider it. The men and women who have changed this world are the men and women the world could not change. Again, another one worth repeating. The men and women who have changed the world are the men and women the world could not change. I like that. Moses was one of those men. There's a picture here of Willie Nelson. Most of all of us are familiar with him. Part I didn't know. When he was starting out in his musical career, he quickly developed a following among the honky-tonks and the bars around Fort Worth, Texas, where he would play and sing. Yet nearly every Sunday morning, he would be found teaching Sunday school. Before long, however, this double life became a problem. And the pastor of the church confronted him regarding his testimony. The pastor explained that he must either give up his class or his lifestyle. Nelson later said, I decided to say, stay with the beer joints. The preacher sounded so wrong to me that I quit the Baptist church. 
when confronted with the choice to come out of the world or not serve as a Sunday school teacher, Willie Nelson chose the world. And yet, you know, you notice he didn't ask him to leave the church. Just, hey, don't, don't damage your testimony. You're teaching Sunday school. You know, you had certain responsibilities come with that. And if you're not willing to sacrifice something, well, you know, hopefully we all think he probably made the wrong choice. Moses, however, made a wise choice. He knew he couldn't be both a friend of the world and a friend of God. On your worksheet there, James 4.4, 4, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. While God had called Moses and the Israelites to leave Egypt, Pharaoh invited them to worship God, but stay connected to Egypt. Many Christians today want both ways. They want to stay connected to the world and at the same time try to serve the Lord. God says that can't be so. That's just not going to work. One reason Christians accept the compromising proposal is that they don't fear the Lord as much as they fear men. But remember the words in Proverbs 9, 10, there on the worksheet, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. You know, sometimes I think we, uh, we rightfully explain, you know, fear often means just a, a great respect. But sometimes it, we let that water it down a little bit, I'm afraid. Uh, fear is respect, yes. But sometimes it's just good old fear. <laughs> and uh, Pastor Tom always shared that he actually got saved because he feared the judgments of God. He did not want to go to hell. It scared him into being saved, you know, and praise God. And so, I, I mean, that, that's real fear. Praise God that he works that way. So, uh, when we fear the Lord, we are going to have the wisdom to make the decision not to compromise when we are tempted. Then letter B, like Moses, we can give a considerate response. We can be considerate in our response. When Pharaoh presented Moses with his compromise, Moses actually prayed for Pharaoh. Uh, Exodus 8, 30 and 31 on your worksheet. And Moses went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord. He, he prayed to God. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses, and he removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants and from his people. There remained not one. Well, just like Pharaoh kept tempting Moses, why don't you just stay in the land? Don't be too different from us. Satan will use various people to tempt us. Just go to church, but don't change anything else. You know, we'll give you up for a couple hours. You know, maybe four hours, that's all right. Just no more than that. Like Moses, you can resist the temptation to compromise. And pray for those who try to lead you to compromise. Then we have, number three, the temptation to corrupt. There's a temptation to corrupt. Pharaoh presented Moses with yet another proposal. Go ahead and sacrifice, he said, but leave your children here in Egypt. Look at uh, Exodus 10, 8 and 9. They're on the worksheet. And Moses and Aaron were brought again unto Pharaoh, and he said unto them, Go, serve the Lord your God, but who are they that shall go? And Moses said, we will go with our young and with our old, with our sons and with our daughters and with our flocks and with our herds will we go, for we must hold a feast unto the Lord. But Pharaoh and the world today offered a different and a divisive proposal. Let it raise a divisive. I think I printed that wrong on there. It actually should be divisive. Uh, Actually, the, the worksheet does that to me once in a while. But anyway, it is more divisive than a divine proposal, okay. coming from Pharaoh especially. Satan wants to corrupt and divide families. Can we all say amen to that, unfortunately? You can have the old generation, he says, but give me the kids. You know, most of us here have grown up with that just exactly going on all around us. You know, it all started... Uh, for us, it seems like. Huh. Nate's fixing it for you. Oh, thank you, Nate. All right. Now, 
Oh, but then we lost the one in between. But uh, there's, a, there's a picture of Karl Marx, and it says, the edu and his quote is there on the worksheet, the education of all children from the moment they can get along without a mother's care shall be in the state institutions at state expense. Yeah. Marx knew if he could get the kids as soon as he could get them, what they were going to have. I think, you know, and uh, rightfully so in my opinion, uh, a lot of people nowadays will call them uh, state schools, not public schools. And I thought, boy, how sad is that though? We've come to that point, exactly what Karl Marx was proposing to have state schools take control of their education. But the philosophy to let the world rear your children didn't start with communism, it started with Satan. Look at Exodus 10, verses 10 and 11 on your worksheet. And he said unto them, Let the Lord be so with you, as I will let you go. And your little ones, look to it, for evil is before you. Not so. Go now, ye that are men, and serve the Lord, for that ye did desire. And they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. In other words, okay, you men go, but, you know, you don't have to worry about your kids. I'll take good care of them. Boy. Well, Pharaoh tempted Moses to let his religion be only for his generation. It's the same temptation the devil offers today. And he says, give me your children. Pharaoh's offer would divide family unity and destroy family heritage. You can take the men, but, but leave the women and children behind. And boy, our culture does everything it can even now to... Uh, emphasize that you know the men are are shown as you know uh, foolish and you know just beer swilling things on TV and in ads you know and so you know really women and children are better off without guys you know all the science proves otherwise but that doesn't stop the message that Satan's putting out there you don't need these guys especially if they're religious or, or conservative or whatever they might be so Today's parents are accosted with the temptations to let their children stay behind when it comes to the family's commitment to serving the Lord. Many Christians today allow the public school and media to have greater influence than they themselves do in their own children's lives. God, on the other hand, wants us to move forward with our children. You know, and I thought of that uh, uh, you know, you, we need to include them in family devotions, you know, get them involved in it and teach them and work with them and do that. Uh, model Christian living and Christian attitudes. We need to model that stuff to our kids, to raise them up in it. Proverbs 22, 6 tells us, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Oh, well, they might seem to escape for a little bit. We've all kind of been there. But when, he, when he's old, he, God's promises he'll come back if we've done the right job as parents. God's instruction to us is not let your children make up their own minds, but rather teach them to train them and to guide them in his ways. You know, too much we parents, uh, you know, and we're told, uh, be, just be their friend, you know, they're going to do their thing, let them do what they want. And that, that's just not the scriptural way. It's our responsibility to bring them along with us in our walk with the Lord. You know, I thought of that. I, I certainly didn't grow up in a, in a Christian home, but I did grow up in a Christian values home. You know, praise God, they, had, uh, they, they stood on Christian values, even though they never attributed to Christ. So it was a little easier step for me than to just throw Christ into it. I didn't have to, to I feel like I was changing the parenting a whole lot, other than just giving all the glory to God and, and why we do it, you know, but I was taught to respect my elders, you know, where'd that go? To, to you know, respect the opposite sex, where'd that go? You know, to, to uh, uh, it, just respect the elders, honor your parents, no cussing or lying, you know, I, I grew up with that, even though it wasn't it told me, you know, here's the scripture that tells you to, so it's not a big step to add that. When you, you know, as far as lifestyle, but it's a huge step in what it can accomplish as they get old and age. So parents, I encourage you to, to do that. Because then, like Moses, we should give a, a committed 
response, a committed response. Moses wasn't going to leave the women and children behind. We're all going to serve and worship the Lord, he said. Again, uh, on the worksheet, and we started with, take this as a pledge, Joshua 24, 15. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And again, I just, uh, you know, that was more as a, a reminder to Kathy and I that I would put that up. You know, maybe I needed reminding more than most, but that's okay. You know, it's just something that uh, we need to be committed to, give a committed response for our households to serve the Lord. Just as the Apostle Paul was able to invite the Corinthian believers to follow him as he followed Christ, so Christian parents should be able to say the same to their children. Our goal, there is 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. And I still remember that this is actually a big turning point. I don't know if I've shared this before in, in my Christian walk. You know, we had good pastors, taught the word, but they'd always say, but, you know, just remember that, you know, preaching the word of God, do what I say, don't necessarily follow me because I'm a sinner. And I go, well, I, make, I like that. That makes sense. Yeah, the, you know, I don't want to, and we don't want to follow after a man. But then you read the word and Paul says, follow me as I am follow Christ. And I thought, wow, that's the way it ought to be, that we can say, hey, go ahead and follow me. You know, to have that, just that root connected to, to the Lord, where we can encourage others to follow us and, and try our best not to uh, display any hypocrisy that would cause them to stumble. You know, and it happens, but to still, I thought that was a real challenge to me to say, I want to be able to say that. You know, and I'm not sure I still can today, but, you know, it's a good goal to have. Follow me as I follow Christ. <clears throat> then uh, we have, number four, the temptation to concede. The temptation to concede. The devil never stops fighting, and sometimes his biggest ammunition seems to be the most subtle. He starts with asking, first, for letter A, a material concession. He asked for a material concession. Exodus 10, 24, there on your worksheet. And Pharaoh called unto Moses and said, Go ye, serve the Lord. Only let your flocks and your herds be stayed. Let your little ones also go with you. So again, Pharaoh's kind of, okay, you can take the kids, take the, but you're leaving, now leave your flocks behind. Leave everything you own. Okay, Pharaoh said, take your wives and kids, just leave your animals here in Egypt. Pharaoh knew he wanted the Israelites to come back and continue to be slaves to the Egyptians. And he knew that if they left their riches in Egypt, they would surely come back. I, I know they'll come back to get their stuff. Well, Satan likewise says, you can sell out to God, but just not all the way. Just don't go all in. He knows that if we don't include our wealth in our worship, we will not serve the Lord long term. If you have made the decision to overcome Satan's offering, offered compromises, you have brought your children with you as you follow the Lord. The devil offers another compromise. Be careful. Don't get all in. Don't get carried away. Your money is yours. You know, just like Jesus to the rich man, you know, go sell everything. Did everything else. And we can do the same thing. We can give him we can do all kinds of stuff for him and with him and with the people. But if we don't go all the way, and money is one of those areas. Why? <clears throat> Satan knows that when you start giving to God, your heart will follow that gift. Luke 12, 34 tells us, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Wow. So uh, then that means giving will be a reflection of your heart. You know, one of our creeds here, if you will, at church is 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And that's, we don't preach a lot about giving here, but when we do, we always say that's what we want you to be, a cheerful giver. You know, it's, uh, yeah, we just want, don't want you to ever feel like you're coerced to give. That's not the point. I've heard sermons and talk where they, you know, 
Uh, you, we're not, we didn't get enough, you know, everybody dig deeper, you know, and I, I saw that too, you know. But if, but if we're holding on to this too tight, you know, you can't pull this out of my hand, you know, I'd say um, you've got to consider this verse, you know. Uh, we don't want to coerce you, but you know what? You should give. You should give. That's one of the commandments we have. Then we should also have letter B, a spiritual conviction. Spiritual conviction. Moses had a conviction. He knew it was impossible for him to leave their herds and their flocks because he was giving, because, because giving was a large part of the way they would worship God. They needed their flocks and herds to sacrifice to the Lord. Exodus 10, 25, and 6, they're on the worksheet. And Moses said, Thou must give us also sacrifices and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice unto the Lord our God. Our cattle also shall go with us. There shall not a hoof be left behind. For therefore we must take to serve the Lord our God, and we know not with what we must serve the Lord until we come thither. In other words, we don't know how much of it, you know, we might need every last hoof of this to give to God and the sacrifice. We don't know. So, Pharaoh, I'm taking it with us. Sorry. It would be easy for us to ask, everything? Every single hoof? I got to give them everything? Does it all have to belong to God? Moses said he didn't know how much they would need to sacrifice, and so they needed everything they owned available. Key word is available. Everything had to come with them. Moses understood that everything he had came from the Lord. First Chronicles 29 and 14, there in the worksheet. But who am I and what is my people that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort? For all things come of thee and thine own have we given thee. In other words, just give them back to God. He gave it to me originally, I'm just trying to give some of it back. Lo and behold, he just gives you more. <laughs> It's incredible how it works, but it works. I've seen it over and over and over. Every part of us belongs to the Lord, our possessions and even ourselves, like at 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. They belong to God, all of us. The price we have been bought with, paid by Jesus, was his blood shed to cover our sins. Everything else we have is very small in contrast. He calls us to worship him with all we have. Worship actually means to ascribe worth to. We're saying we, that's valuable. So when we are willing to give him everything, we are saying, Lord, I count you worthy and trust you to replenish what I give you. You know, someday, and I think maybe sooner than later, we might just be called to give all or maybe just to walk away from everything. You know, we, we need to prepare our hearts for that. And I've told the kids that for a long time. You know, we just, yeah, this might be nice, but it's not ours. You know, use it for God and because... It could happen, you know, maybe not allowed to buy and sell. You know, you've all heard that. Or who knows what's going to They might take property because we can't pay the property taxes with the stuff they want us to. Anyway, I can go on and on with that. We'll hear about that in Revelation, maybe. So, but what Moses did, he realized that giving was a part of their worship and giving was a reflection of their heart. So in conclusion, God is a God of great love for you. And for me, God loves us. He wants fellowship with us, and he is jealous for that fellowship. The devil is constantly trying to pull us back from serving God completely and does everything he can to keep you from becoming a committed Christian. He offers many compromises along the way, and they fall under four main categories that we looked at this morning. He tempts you to conform he says, it's okay to have a Christian bumper sticker, to know a few songs, and even praise Jesus on Sunday, but stay connected to the world. He tempts you to compromise. He says, don't go too far, 
Keep some of those choice words in your vocabulary. Be able to converse about worldly things. And he tempts you to corrupt. He says, leave your children behind. You can love God, but it doesn't matter if everyone else in your family loves him. Let them make their own decisions. Then he tempts us to concede. He says, don't sacrifice. You can go to church and maybe even serve in some ways. But certainly don't get involved with your treasure. Goodness, don't, don't let that go. But praise God, the Bible gives us hope. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, There hath no temptation taken you, but as such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above what ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. And we might not choose to take that way, but it's always provided to us. When Satan comes to you, as Pharaoh did to Moses, tempting you to do it his way, there is a way for you to escape. The way to escape is to obey the word of God. After Jesus had fasted 40 days, Satan came to him and said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. In that moment, Jesus resisted through the word of God. Matthew 4.4 4. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Hold on to God's word. Be rooted in Jesus Christ. The world will constantly try to pull you, but the word of God will be your anchor in times of temptation to compromise. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for your challenge of this morning. Lord, and just your wonderful word and the example of Moses leading his people from you and, and just uh, helping us, Lord, to not conform. Lord, to not compromise, to not corrupt, and, oh, Lord God, to not concede. Strengthen us in those areas so that we can put all those temptations of the Satan behind us. Bear us up and strengthen us, I pray. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. And we ask that you'd be with the, the sermon to follow as we look more at the, uh, the thrill of hope. Looking forward to that this morning as you will just help us keep our focus on you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. All right, real quick, this week's devotions to help uh, reinforce this this morning are going to be good. Tear down the high places, number one. What have we elevated to the position of idle status in our own lives? Number two, don't look back. You know, and I thought, oh, that's probably going to be about Lot's wife. Little, little spoiler, it's not. That's one of the most famous look backs, but that's not what our lesson is this week. But don't look back. Number three, contra mundum. I thought, okay, that has to be a typo, you know. So I had to look ahead to make, you'll understand it if you do the lesson. I'm not, I can tell you, but uh, I'm not gonna. You're gonna have to do the lesson to figure that one out. Number four, be not conformed. And number five, partial obedience. Things we talked about this morning and to reinforce this week.